interaction with labor leaders. Are we ready? Great. Please join in welcoming Henry Guerrero, Executive Director, District Council 37, Gary LaBarbera, President of the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York, Sandy Vito, Executive Director of 1199 SEIU Training and Employment Funds. They are in conversation with Kathleen Colhane, who you met earlier, our board chair, President of Non-Traditional Employment for Women, and NY, as I said, NYCETC's board chair. Please give this esteemed body a huge round of applause. We are grateful for their presence today. All right, thank you, Greg, um, and really excited for uh, this robust discussion we're about to have. Um, so it's my honor. So we're going to jump right in. Um, so talking about post-pandemic economic recovery in New York City, it's unique compared to the rest of the nation. New York City has recovered only 77% of its pandemic job losses, and the city has consistently lagged behind other major cities and states in its recovery. The nation overall has recovered over 96% of its pandemic job loss. And we're also facing a bleak fiscal forecast and the trend of the great resignation. So starting with Sandy and going down the line, Sandy, Gary, then, then Henry, um, how does the statement resonate with you and what are you seeing right now? And how does this moment differ from previous recessions and economic downturns? Well, I, I guess I would start with uh, healthcare specific because I think my colleagues will address some of the other areas. But in healthcare, you know, you had folks on the front line risking their lives every day during the pandemic, and what we saw were a number of retirements. Um, it, people were exhausted. Much like the rest of the economy, it is bifurcated, right? So when we're talking about the recession, we have a lot of shortages in occupations, particularly good paying occupations, nurses, respiratory therapists, imaging. And then we also have, um, even though they're unionized, you know, home health aides and CNAs where the work is the kind of work that caregivers want to do, but it's not the conditions of the of the work are not good. So um, the union fights, you know, very hard for systemic change, but there are uh, significant problems recruiting in those occupations. And so we have to think about healthcare as a very highly credentialed industry. So I know lots of people think about job training and they want to talk about literacy and necessary but not sufficient. The piece that you want to think about in healthcare is how do we orient people and get the right people into the sector post pandemic? And it's not always just COVID, right? I mean, people aren't, when we do surveys, it's not fear of COVID anymore, it's more exhaustion. And then how do we create programs that reach the levels of credential that are important in the industry? So it's not a two week training program, it's a two year training program to become a nurse or a respiratory therapist. And I'll stop there because I don't want to short panel. <laughs> so thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. So I will speak to uh, the construction industry for a moment, but let me let me just make an observation to your direct question. So you when you state that New York is, compared to the rest of the country, you know, is lagging. I mean, I think the first thing you have to think about is the pandemic itself. And you have to realize that New York City, New York was the epicenter of the pandemic. New York City was particularly hit harder than many other areas in, in the nation. So that's that's one factor in and of itself. That's one point. The other point is, I think what the pandemic did, in fact, is it transformed many uh, workers' ideas of the way work can be done. And I know from talking to a lot of uh, corporate heads and, and building owners that only now are really building uh, vacancies beginning to come down um, and part of that is because of the kind of a cultural shift in certain industries where people want to have a better work life mix and doing that is a way to do that rather is is through remote working so i think that's part of one of the reasons there's this perception that we're lagging but in terms of the construction industry itself, I can tell you emphatically 
that the industry, the developers uh, in the private sectors are very, very bullish on, on the future. Actually, you know, they, they feel uh, that over the next five to seven years, we're gonna have a very robust uh, industry. Obviously, tying it into the question as well, one of the problems is when you're in a financial circumstance as we are today, and in particular, you know, the Fed is continuing to raise rates to try to slow the economy, perhaps bring us into a recession, possibly. But that makes it that one of the industries that's impacted largely is in the construction industry because of lending. Right. So I think just, you know, I'll put a pin in it there. But I, I could say that in terms of uh, the outlook, there is a, a lot of willingness and eagerness to uh, build in this city. Um, one of the things that, you know, I, I uh, heard this morning, frankly, from the governor uh, is that you know, the data is backing up. More and more people are wanting to come to New York. We heard this with Google, where, you know, Google said, all right, you have to be in an office, any office you want. And over a thousand employees of theirs decided they wanted to come to New York. So I'm very confident and very optimistic that New York is going to come back as strong as it ever was. Yeah, and so you heard from healthcare, you heard from construction. I think I will take an opportunity to speak about government because quite often we miss the fact that 10% of the city's workforce works in government. And that government suffers the same pressures and challenges than all these uh, private industries do. And right now we are really suffering. And I will reserve comments about the collective bargaining agreement for city workers, which is far more complicated. But I will talk about the two biggest challenges that I see uh, in recruitment and retention. Uh, one is wages. Uh, right now, uh, it, you know, with all the efforts that we made to raise the minimum wage of $15 an hour across the board, which is great, and I'm very proud of what we did for that. We have 32,000 city workers that are made between 15 and 18 bucks an hour. Now, when you have uh, McDonald's, when you have Whole Foods, when you have all these private industries trying to recruit people at 18 and $20 an hour, with none of the requirements that you have to comply to become a city worker, that becomes a challenge to recruit and retain the best and the brightest. And it's on both ends because right now we have a serious vacancy problem. So uh, I, you know, if you add the off budget agencies, we have approximately 400,000 city workers. So just as we have a problem at the low end, we have a problem at the high end. I have 22% vacancies on cybersecurity positions. These are positions that make 150,000 and above. Why? Because the private industry is paying them a minimum of 100,000 above that. And so the same challenges that we have. So wages is an absolute necessity how we realize wages. And I think there's an issue of impact, right? So. Uh, you can recruit in the Department of Buildings, 22% vacancy right now. Well, you can't do the construction that Gary was talking about. You can't approve the permits, right? You can recruit lifeguards where well, you can open the beaches. So not only are you affecting the quality of life of people, but the concession of the businesses who work around the beaches are affected. You know, the income that comes in for the sales of that is affected. So there's a multiplying effect on it. And the second issue is the issue to the failure to recognize that work is changing. Telecommuting is something that should have been talked about in city government before, and yet we insist everybody has to come back and the office has to be the same nine to five or 10 to six or whatever you want to say in an office setup. We have the technology now improve that to be able to do the work as efficiently uh, from home, right? Not every day, but there has to be a recognition that the, the, the job has changed that the workplace and the office has changed. And I'll give you an example of that. I had a meeting yesterday with all the attorneys that work, work as comp. So what happens if you're home and in telecommuting and you spill some milk and you fall over, right? Is that a cover case in the work as comp, right? Somebody, it happened to somebody here because it's happening. Guess what? Every single one of the claims that you get hurt at home is being controverted. So there's no recognition that that work at home is now an, an acceptable and a viable way of doing that. So we need to change if we're going to do that because otherwise we're going to remain behind in government and we're not going to recruit and retain the best and the brightest that we need in order to get uh, services done to their need. <laughs> so
So keeping on the topic of good paying careers, um, again, we'll go down the line. So what are the specific investments, commitments, strategies that need to be made by the city and state in partnership with labor, of course, to build pipelines to good paying careers? How do we transition from a workforce development mindset to a career development focus? And what are the specific challenges here? Well, so it's, it's actually a fairly simple calculation in healthcare. Um, I, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually not a labor leader. I'm the uh, executive director of the training fund. My colleagues, Gary and, and Henry are the real labor leaders. George Gresham is our la labor leader who couldn't be here. But in terms of education pathways, and we've been doing education pathways in healthcare since 1969. But our, the way our fund is structured under law, we can only provide career pathways. So we have people who are working in dietary in the kitchens who've become director of respiratory therapy. I mean, we have had career pathways since 1969. We, we, you know, longer than most people in the country and we've created all the wraparound services, but we, the challenge we have right now with all of these occupational shortages, we can't reach outside of the labor market to provide those same services. So when I think of public education and public workforce development systems, the key is to create opportunities that help the very people that we're talking about who have not yet been reemployed find ways to advance their careers. And that is not just, again, I can't repeat enough, it's not just very simple courses. We have to dream and assume that somebody who's outside of the labor market right now can become a nurse with the right support systems. And I think many of you have heard me say that before, but we have to really invest in the people of New York City in, in, very edu in, in, in terms of education with lots of support systems, which are, means stipends, childcare, transportation costs, so that you can reach that dream and help fill those shortages because it's not just nursing. I use that because that's what people know, but there are a lot of opportunities in healthcare and we're not investing in people to be able to take those opportunities. That's a great response, Sandy. Um, and I'm going to uh, kind of uh, tag along on one of the issues where I think the city uh, could make an important investment, and that is in, in child care. Um, one of the biggest barriers, and uh, Kathleen is very familiar with this, I just want to, you know, she serves as the, the chairperson of non-traditional employment for women. This is one of the pre-apprentice and direct entry programs that uh, is affiliated with the New York City Building Trades Council, and it's a very successful program. We're very proud of the work that we do together. And we're actually, along with our national organization and partnering with NEW here in New York, we're, we're trying to establish a pilot for childcare in the construction industry. And so why is it different? It is different. And the reason it's different, and I'll just and I'll move on to a broader uh, conversation in a moment, but you know, the hours of work in the construction industry are certainly not nine to five or, 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 or you know, normal hours of work. Generally, you know, if construction begins, if you live in the city, you know this and probably complain about it, but uh, at the latest 7 a.m. in the morning, uh, sometimes depending upon the area and special variances, 6 a.m. in the morning, and oftentimes if there are late concrete pours, it could go to four or five in the evening. Um, so these are long days. And so you, in order for a worker to be at a job site at 6 a.m., you know, they need to be up at 4 a.m. and they need to drop their children off at 5 a.m. And they may not be able to pick the children back up till 5 or 6 p.m. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it is a, a barrier for females entering the industry. So I think one of the roles that the city can, I agree with Sandy, can really invest in is looking at childcare because it is a fundamental need uh, especially, you know, for workers and that and investing in childcare and broadening the opportunity there is investing in people. So that that's one thing. I also will, will say, you know, it's interesting, very interesting that uh, fortuitous really that, you know, I'm with San we're with Sandy today and she's talking about healthcare because just prior to this event where the mayor was, was, and I was with the mayor and the governor this morning at an event was the announcement of the Kipps Bay CUNY Life Sciences Center. And this is going to be really focused on life sciences and really kind of developing the nursing uh, field and 
be able to put them through these uh, educational programs and actually a, a, a attach a job to them. So very important. So, and, and for that, you know, this is a long-term plan. That is an investment. That is something the city can do. And now all of that construction will result in union construction jobs. So one of the things that, you know, I've had this conversation with some of the folks right here in this room and certainly with the mayor over the years and every government, uh, governmental elected official is that there really needs to be a cognizant thought process investment into creating pathways into union apprenticeship programs. And that's the key. And, and I think, you know, we've worked very successfully to this point with, the, with this with Adams administration and prior administrations with establishing what they call project labor agreements that, you know, require really union career paths for city work. But I, I want to just kind of emphasize one point. The, the most important thing is without that pathway uh, and a sustainable pathway, we can have uh, careers. And I think if you think about the three individuals here that are representing different labor organizations, we're not talking about jobs. We're not talking about a job that you go to and then in a year, like in the construction industry, you know, a year and a half, two years, the, the, the project is over and that means your job is over. We're talking about career pathways to have a career in healthcare, to have a career in the, the construction industry, to have a career working for a city agency. And I am thoroughly convinced that the only real pathways into those type of careers are through a union job, a union career, and a union training program or a union apprentice program. So I think the, the, the role of the city it can be, and it is, and it, it could, you know, there's always room to expand is to really continue to think about investment into training. We know the offshore wind industry, the, uh, the uh, solar industry, we think about renewables. This is gonna create a whole new green economy. There are gonna be thousands of jobs available and we need in the building trades, we're gonna construct all that work that's in statute. We need to have training. We need to be able to build new training facilities for specific types of training and in, in government and the city certainly could play a role in supporting and making the investments into people to find career pathways. Thank you. So those of you who know me, I'm Dominican and, and <laughs> one of the things we do, right? We do a lot of family, loud music, food, you know, all that stuff. We have two rules in our family. Do not talk about baseball <laughs> and do not talk about unions because one of them is likely gonna end up in a fist fight uh, but even with those rules, there's always somebody bound to talk about the Yankees and Boston and, you know, the whole nine. And somebody's going to mention a union and most likely it's going to be like, hey, Henry, could you give me a job? Yeah, I want not, nothing serious. I can do office cleaning and I, I just want to make 100,000 plus, right? I hook me up, right? And I mean, then you say, well, wait a minute, it doesn't work that way. You need to be trained. You need to be, did you take an exam, right? Most city jobs, as a result of the Tommy Hall, right, require you to take a civil service exam, right? And you say that, hey, I can send you a list of, no, 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 no. I just want you to call somebody, right? And so this is what happens, right? I know that we did everything possible to make sure that people who are hired by government are the most trained, the most qualified. But we have gone overboard. We have made the hurdles of employment so high and so difficult and so convoluted you have to get fingerprinted. You have to pay $300 to take a test that you may or may not pass. And you have people like, you, an example, we have 500 sanitation jobs, 92,000 people apply, right? Yeah, they make 100,000 and, and that, but you gotta be trained, right? And up into 2017, for architects, engineers, and IT, this is a fact, the city was spending $2.85 in training them every year. So most of that training, recruitment, and retention to prepare people for those jobs are left out to the union. So to Gary's point, apprenticeship program, pre-apprenticeship programs, education funds like Sandy's and, and ours do exactly that. But we haven't made the investment. We haven't made the investment of programs that can, for workforce development of many of you who represent here. And it seems like we're always begging to do what we're required to do. And, and if you think about the history of labor, the history of, of development in this country, there's always been a recognition you have to train folks to get them prepared to do the job. And if you don't, we're not willing to invest that, you're gonna get what you get now, which is problems of recruitment, retention, 
high turnover rates, right? I have a 38% turnover rate in social workers right now. 38%. We have a problem with mental health in the city, right? I can't get anybody to do a subway run to pick up problem people with mental health. And I can't get anyone to accept even with a higher salary when there's a mental health call because once you don't pay them enough, two, you don't respect them enough to listen to their opinions. And third, they feel like they're just shuffling people around and they got into government because not of the salaries, believe me. They got into government because they believe in something and you're not listening to their voices. You're not listening and respecting the very professionals who do that and I think that's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's what Einstein said. What we're doing in the city is insanity. We are not respecting the people who do the work. And if we continue to do it, we're going to continue to have the same results. So we're unfortunately at final thoughts. Final thought, I know already. So I know. So we talked about opportunity. We talked about careers. We talked about wages. We want to um, touch on equity and a short final thought, and we're going to go down the road. Well, I guess I would uh, be remiss if we're talking about equity if we didn't talk about home care workers. The so we know as a society that. Um, home care workers allow us often to do work because they're taking care of our parents. They allow people with disabilities often to be in the workplace. They're really essential to our economy and we don't treat them like that. So when we think about workforce development and equity, it has to be surrounded with some better public policy that values jobs you know, just as Henry is saying, some of the public sector jobs, when you're thinking about service workers, particularly service workers where the history, I'm just going to say it, right? It comes from, you know, the whole industry was built in the past on um, exploiting immigrant workers and before that, um, the free labor, labor of enslaved workers. So if that's where the industry was built, we need to break through that and think about different policy options that value that work. Um, appropriately, because right now it's just contingent labor at a very low wage um, because of the shortage of hours. Uh, hour, there's like a demand for it, but only in short hour jobs, right? So, so we have a lot to work through to make those jobs better. The union did fight and get a $3 increase for the home care workers. So that's a real step in the right direction. So we're making strides, but there's a lot more to do. Well, uh, you know, that's a a really good question, and, and uh, it's very hard to put in a final uh, thought. I gotta say, but let me let me say this way, say it this way to you. In terms of when I think about equity, if you think about the construction industry, obviously there are union projects and there are open shop projects where there are non-union workers that work for non-union contractors. I will tell you, most of the time, those non-union contractors are unscrupulous contractors. This is a fact. There's an underbelly in this industry. I think about those workers who are regularly exploited. Um, you know, if you, you think about the construction industry and you think about, and Kathleen, you're very well aware of this, several years ago, you know, we had 21, 22 fatalities a year in the construction industry. Uh, 85 to 90% of those workers were uh, non-union workers. Those workers, 50, over 50% 50 of those workers were not English speaking workers. And when I think about the level of abuse and exploitation in the non-union sector, it, this is something that as the unionized construction industry, you know, we fight again. We don't, we fight against this. We don't just fight for our members. We fight for all workers and certainly all construction workers in this city. And we would pass the law, local law 197, which requires mandatory training for every construction worker. We had Carlos's law that we're waiting to have signed where Carlos Mancaya was killed uh, because of an unscrupulous contractor forcing him to work in an unsafe trench. Uh, and it was the unionized construction industry got a law passed in Albany 
um, that now has penalties. I mean, that individual, the penalty for that, what I would say is a murder, was $10,000 with no criminal, for the contractor with no, no criminality. So you're telling me that a, a life is worth $10,000? So we've changed that, and now there are criminal uh, 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 um, consequences, as well as a minimum of a $500,000 payment, half a million to the family. Right, same issue on wage theft. Wage theft is a big problem in the non-union industry. We passed a law which was signed into law, Wage Theft Protection Act, so that these workers. So when I think about equity, you know, if you are in the unionized construction industry, in the union, you know, the co collective bargaining agreement is the great equalizer, right? But if you're a non-union worker, you know, that's where we have to work and really have to understand what they're going through. Um, and how much they are abused. Uh, and, you know, we try to organize, we do organize, Kathleen, you know that. One of the things that we have focused on in the last decade in particular is really bringing diversity into the building trades through our pre-apprentice and direct ed entry programs. And I can tell you statistically today, the building trades membership is majority minority, almost 70% of uh, people coming into the building trades apprentice training programs are a minority, so you know that's part of equity too, making sure that all people from all communities, in particular marginalized and underserved communities, have an opportunity to come into the middle class with a career pathway. So, I mean, I'll, I'll put a pin in it there, but I, I could really talk a lot about the situation uh, in terms of equity and the difference between a union career and a non-union job. Thank you, Gary. Henry, final thoughts? Yeah, so if you see my picture out there, you can see that I had hair once. Um, when I started this, it's, it's not Photoshop. And <laughs> part, of, <laughs> part of the reason I lost my hair is because I feel like I'm yelling at the wind at these concepts. And I say, look, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. In the height of the Industrial Revolution in this country, we had a concept called hiring halls, right? You bring people together. If I were to say to this group, I have 100 jobs in five agencies, it pays $50,000 a year, the requirements. Come to one center, one hiring hall. Send as many qualified people as you can and train them. And we can connect them. They can understand whatever bureaucratic requirements they have to do. We can have the union rules here. We can have the benefits here. They can get their fingerprinted. They can sign up. We can waive the payment. You know, it would be, I think, a great idea to implement, right? I supposed to have 50,000 hiring centers all bifurcated and all that stuff. And, and case in point, at the height of the Black Lives Matter protest here, we had 100 jobs in the police department. Nobody wanted to apply for it. It was not a good, attractive place to be, especially they were trying to attract minority and people of color. So we said, leave it to us. We did a hiring hall, and, and they claim it was posted at every precinct including Staten Island, some places nobody wanted to. We did a centralized hiring hall. We communicated with churches, with community groups, with community organizations, with a lot of the groups that are here. 1,200 people showed up for the jobs. And we hired on that day, not only enough to fill those 200 jobs, but enough to have a bank of folks who be on a waiting list should the position become available. That's a prime example of a hiring work working. So if you heard what I said before about all these we need hiring halls back in government. And we need to connect the people who are doing the training, the recruitment with the jobs that are available and make it as simple as possible for people to navigate a good paying, yes, union job uh, that won't make you lose your hair. <laughs> well, please join me in thanking our esteemed panel. Thank you all.